Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Webcast CPE Standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Gift Acceptance Policies for Not-for-Profits. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers, April Stiff and Angie Fidler. April has been in public accounting since 2001. She focuses on tax-exempt organizations as well as trust and estate clients. April is a trusted business advisor to her clients, providing compliance and consulting in a variety of areas relating to the Form 990 and charitable estate planning. She is a member of the firm's government, not-for-profit, and private client services groups. Angie has been in public accounting since 2008, focusing predominantly on not-for-profit tax compliance, research, and planning, including specialty issues such as excess benefit transactions, unrelated business income, and employee benefits. Her specialty niches include providing services to institutions of higher education and independent schools, private foundations, healthcare, social services, and the arts. In addition to supporting the firm's tax practice, Angie has authored many articles in industry publications and spoken before business, professional, and not-for-profit industry groups on a number of topics, including Form 990, unrelated business income, and program-related investments. Angie, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. Thanks, April. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have an exciting agenda for you today, um, talking about gift acceptance policies, different gifts that can be accepted, and things to consider. So just a brief overview of the agenda. We're going to dig right into an example of gifts of publicly traded stock, just to set the foundation and the tone for today's discussion. From there, we're going to go into gift acceptance policy benefits, why a policy is important, things to consider when developing a gift acceptance policy, IRS documentation that's mandatory outside of the gift acceptance policy itself, and then additional factors to consider when maintaining a gift acceptance policy. So to um, get everything started and make sure that you're set with your coffee and ready to enjoy this wonderful discussion, we're going to start with a polling question. What type of organization do you represent? Are you a private foundation, private operating foundation? public charity that's not a higher ed institution. Um, perhaps you're representing another not-for-profit organization, Moss Adams employee, or another professional advisor. I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer.
Okay. All right. So this is the these are the types of organizations we have represented this morning. Um, and while all of the discussion pertains to those of you in the audience, um, this just gives us a general layout of our geography and um, groups here today. With that, I'm going to turn it over to April, um, and she'll start with our example. OK, great. Thanks, Angie. So um, I'm going to go ahead and lay out in a true example of something that's happened in one of our charities here. So Mr. or Mrs. Donor make a pledge to charity of $10,000. They contact their broker to transfer 100 shares of XYZ stock to charity. XYZ stock is publicly traded and is selling for $100 per share when they contacted their broker. The broker contacted charity to obtain the account information to transfer the stock into. Charity had to get board approval to release the account information to broker. XYZ, um, at that point in time when they received the approval, was trading at $90 per share. Mr. and Mrs. Donor received a confirmation of the stock transfer from their broker. Now that Charity has received the stock, they must either keep the stock or sell it. Since Charity does not have an investment portfolio to add the XYZ stock into, the logical choice would be to sell the stock received. Unfortunately, Charity has no standing order to sell any publicly traded stock received into their investment account, and the only two authorized individuals on the account are on vacation. The board passes a resolution to sell the XYZ stock, and one of the authorized individuals once they're back from vacation, of course, calls Charity's brokers instructing the sale of XYZ, which is now selling at $95 per share. The Charity's next step is to record the contribution in their own accounting records and provide the donors with an acknowledgement letter of the stock gift. Charity's bookkeeper records a contribution of $9,500 from Mr. and Mrs. Donor and prepares the acknowledgement letter. The letter thanks Mr. and Mrs. Donor for their $9,500 donation of XYZ stock and informs them there is a remaining balance of $500 due on their pledge. Upon receipt of the letter, Mr. and Mrs. Donor are extremely upset. So as you probably um, assumed, Charity does not have a written gift acceptance policy. However, some of the issues that occurred would have been avoided if Charity had had those procedures and policies in place. So we're moving on to our next polling question. Um, does your organization have a written gift acceptance policy? Yes, but we only accept cash and marketable securities. Yes, we accept other things. No, I don't know. We'll go ahead and keep these open for about 30 seconds. And please make sure you hit the submit button to make sure your answers are recorded. Okay, excellent. So it looks like about half of you in the audience do accept, um, do have a written gift acceptance policy and do accept um, things, uh, assets more than just cash and public, publicly traded securities. So now I'm going to hand it over to Angie to discuss some additional items on written gift acceptance policies. Thanks, April. Um, so in the example April gave, we covered a number of instances um, of donor communication, valuation concerns. In that case, we were looking at publicly traded securities, so not an unusual gift, um, which 
as you know, gets a lot more complicated. Um, but even with just the basic gift of publicly traded securities, there are issues that you can run into. So jumping into our next topic, um, how can a gift acceptance policy assist with uh, donor communication and internal uh, substantiation and processing? Why does a gift acceptance policy in writing even matter? Well, a couple of items to consider here. <clears throat> First of all, uh, just to note, uh, it's considered a best practice to have a written gift acceptance policy, uh, but it's not mandated by law. Um, on the Form 990, um, if you're a public charity filing a 990 rather than a private foundation, there's a schedule called Schedule M, um, as in man, that relates specifically to non-cash contributions. That schedule is required if your organization receives over $25,000 in a given year of non-cash contributions. On that particular schedule, there is a question that asks if there is a written gift acceptance policy for review of non-standard gifts. So that's another reason to have a policy like this in place. In addition to that, this policy is really a means to evaluate risks for your organization. That includes reputational risks, accepting perhaps a controversial uh, gift or from a controversial organization. Um, also helps your organization evaluate costs and benefits of accepting a non-standard gift um, outside the norm of your, your cash and publicly traded securities standard gifts. Um, in addition, thinking through why you want a little bit more <laughs> bureaucracy in an organization, um, Nonprofits are not in the business of holding non-charitable use or charitable assets. So these assets may not align well or at all with your mission. Um, they have costs to hold or sell, perhaps maintain uh, the, the gift itself, so that could distract from the mission. A written gift acceptance policy may provide a means to hedging, upsetting a potential donor, uh, by giving your organization a way to politely say no thank you for non-standard gift. For example, um, there are a lot of uninhabited hospitals sitting around the country, and the owners of those may think, uh, well, I'll just gift that to a nonprofit. Um, the nonprofit could sell it and um, use the cash to filter back into the mission, or perhaps the land is of use. Same thing with certain houses in different areas. Um, we've seen gifts of horses before. Uh, some of those items are costly to maintain, costly to dispose of. There may be environmental concerns. All of that to say you don't necessarily want to say no to a donor. That's uncomfortable, especially if somebody's trying to give you a hospital that could be worth uh, millions of dollars. But looking at the cost-benefit analysis, uh, it may not be worth it to your organization to accept a non-standard gift such as that. So a policy, a written policy to fall back on to say this is outside the means of our policy is really allows your organization a little backup support to saying no thank you. In addition to that, the policy does also help document the responsibility for each step in the donation process. Ultimately, it's documenting who is authorized to accept gifts on behalf of the organization, um, what process to go through, when the board should be involved, and all of this documentation is extremely helpful in the case of turnover in the organization's um, development department or key decision making or even board turnover. So now that we know why a written gift acceptance policy matters, how do you go about developing one if you don't have one, or things to consider if you do have one in place already and are looking to review it and update it as necessary? First, consider who the audience is. Um, whenever writing a policy, it's important to note who's going to be reading it and rely upon, relying upon it um, and ultimately in charge of enforcing it. For a gift acceptance policy, um, especially for non-standard gifts, 
is this a policy that's going to be just internal or is it going to be external? Are you going to post it to your website? Um, are donors going to be able to access that? Are you going to refer donors to your policy should they have any questions? That will really set the tone. Even perhaps you may have two separate policies, um, one for internal use and one for external. And the internal one may have guidelines for staff and board members to enact that policy. And then always, in whatever decision you're making in the nonprofit sector, we know first and foremost the mission is what we rest upon. So aligning gifts and their sources with your mission is so important. What if you're given um, this outstanding gift or a, a pledge from um, somebody in the oil and gas industry? That may be outside of your mission. Um, it may be outside of your investment policy. It may be something uh, that would turn off other don donors if they knew that you were accepting gifts from uh, somebody in that world. So having that really well established within your policy is helpful. Types of gifts, um, you can't always address every single type of gift that's going to come your way. So if certain gifts are not acceptable, consider listing those. In the example I just used, if um, a gift of an oil well is unacceptable to your organization, um, then Outlining that specifically in your policy will be helpful um, in case future issues come up. When reviewing potential gifts, what is the process? Who is involved? And at what point should legal counsel be included in discussions? Um, and circling back on the, this example that's now being carried forward, um, if you are considering a non-standard gift that may um, frustrate other donors, may be against or in a gray area when it comes to your mission or your uh, business practices, uh, legal counsel will help um, get involved, review any agreements, review any discussions, and help uh, kind of get your cover your back when it comes to those legal discussions. Um, for reviewing those potential gifts, any potential gift, um, perhaps over a certain threshold or just all non-standard gifts, whatever makes the most sense to your organization, consider establishing a committee um, that can review these gifts. And then also noting in your policy at what point should uh, the board be involved for review of a non-standard gift. Again, if you're being gifted a hospital um, and that land would be really beneficial to your organization, uh, the, the gift, let's just say, is $10 million. Um, or thereabouts. That's a, a, a substantial gift to most organizations, um, and the board would likely want to be involved in understanding the implications of that gift. So outlining in your policy the specific circumstances or um, even the vague circumstances which would initiate board review, such as a dollar amount or the type of gift, is helpful. In the case of conflicts of interest, um, this is always a tough situation to be in, uh, whether it's business dealings, uh, loans to or from, um, or in this case, uh, acceptance of gifts. First of all, again, reminder, legal counsel can and should be pulled in whenever there is a substantial conflict of interest noted. Um, this will also overlap nicely with your conflict of interest policy. Um, and for those of you very familiar with the 990, uh, Schedule L um, is the schedule that encompasses transactions with interested persons. Interested persons are those individuals that have a, a higher than normal stake in the organization. So board members, uh, key decision makers within the organization, their family members, and then in addition to that, substantial contributors. Um, so consider acceptance of the gifts carefully from substantial donors. They are subject and could be subject to uh, additional disclosures on Schedule L if this pulls them into that substantial donor category. Um, so if, for example, you have a donor that's giving you that hospital for $10 million, you decide you want to go for it, that donor um, is 
now considered a substantial donor to your organization. Um, and they own a business, 100% of a business that helps do construction for your organization. Um, that Venn diagram of interactions with your organization uh, is great. First of all, you've established a great relationship that's um, very rewarding to the organization and has somebody uh, highly pulled into the fold of your mission. But the trickle-down effect is how much influence can that particular person now exert over your organization and operations? Um, and that transaction between the board member's organization and yours could likely rise to the level of further disclosure on your 990, which is a public document. So things to consider in that world. Your policy um, should also cover substantiation. It was such a vague word. There's many different uh, types of substantiation for gifts. Um, but what I'm referring to here is who is in charge, what should be provided to a donor um, and maintained internally. And in, in terms of substantiation, we'll dig into more um, the IRS requirements here shortly that may or not may not be included right in your gift acceptance policy. Additional factors to consider um, restricted gifts. Uh, anytime a, a donor restricts a gift, there is an additional carrying cost of the value of that gift on your books. Um, and then maintaining and tracking the restrictions for ultimate release of the restriction or just making sure the funds go to the proper use. Um, so set forth criteria in your gift acceptance policy for which restricted gifts will be accepted. This could be minimum funding, so for an endowment or a scholarship fund, perhaps somebody can donate to it, but you want them to start at $10,000 um, because that makes the most sense for your organization. Um, ultimate variance power, so um, documenting and in donor agreements as well as in your policy if you have variance powers should uh, the mission change or that scholarship not be needed anymore or what have you. Um, again, another great point to bring in legal um, counsel and your accountants as well. Costs related to the donation is a big theme that we've seen throughout this discussion. Um, there are donors that wish to give property that may be encumbered so may have mortgage on it or other such debt, um, that debt service should be taken into consideration. Is that something you want to take on? How does that impact the uh, deduction to the donor? Um, and how does that impact your ultimate liquidation of that gift if that's what you choose to do? Or if you're using it in your mission, um, consider the cost of accepting that gift as you have to service that debt on a go-forward basis. Other costs include cost to sale, maintain, and fix. Um, the policy should identify who is responsible for um, all sales costs, fees um, related to the transfer, including your legal fees and other professional fees. Uh, that also gives the organization, your organization, a little bit more substance to let donors know when they are giving you a non-standard gift that they are um, in charge of covering the costs of transference of that gift. Contributed services is another one you may wish to cover in your gift acceptance policy. Um, pro bono services, uh, perhaps covering who will give what types of pro bono, pro bono services you're interested in receiving, um, and if there's any conflicts of interest related to those services. And of course, any exceptions that you can think of, um, how to determine uh, when you'll provide an exception to a non-standard gift. So uh, the hospital example, let's say it's got debt on it, um, there will be significant cost to disposal, some environmental cleanup. Um, and so just on the surface, this seems like a bad idea, but let's say that that property is one that you've been waiting um, to take over for a while because it's uh, contiguous to your campus and would really allow you to expand residential halls. Uh, so if there's an additional benefit 
outside what's outlined in the policy, identifying ex that exceptions can occur in the process for which uh, approval of that gift should take place. All policies should indicate um, who is accountable, uh, that the policy will be periodically reviewed, and when, and then who will conduct that review, just so that it stays fresh, uh, which may be why some of you have joined us today is to discuss that. All right, our next polling question. Who do you think should be involved in developing a gift acceptance policy? Uh, board of Directors, Executive Director, CFO Controller, Development Director, all of the above or none of the above? I wish we had some fun music for you to listen to. Um, but I can't sing, so I won't be providing that. <laughs> but I'll give you about 30 seconds um, to submit. So choose your answer, press submit, so that we can get that recorded. All right, um, so anyone that chose Board of Directors, Executive Director, CFO Controller, and Development Director, you're correct, but all of the above is the best answer. Those individuals will have great input um, and a different perspective, um, and also be able to add in the nuts and bolts of how to implement this policy and enforce it over time. All right. In terms of documentation, we talked a little bit about substantiation um, and documentation within your policy. The IRS has a number of rules. These rules vary based off of what type of gift um, will be received. And so we'll talk about various different types of IRS mandated documentation. So to start off with, anytime your organization re receives a gift, um, and are taking a deduction on their individual tax return. Uh, if the gift is over $250, there's mandated documentation required. It's the donor's responsibility to obtain the written acknowledgement before claiming the deduction on his or her return, just as an FYI, um, but good donor relationship um, indicates that these types of communications should occur uh, regularly, and a lot of times organizations are providing uh, thank you notes or you know, proper written acknowledgement of a gift, um, no matter the dollar amount, and regularly throughout the year. From the IRS's standpoint, what qualifies as uh, written communication or uh, proper substantiation to take a gift? Uh, the bank record can do that. Um, also, written communication from your organization. Uh, that begs the question, what is written communication defined as? And there's no IRS standards, so there's no just blank form that they put on their website that says, here is what we expect you to provide to your donors. They do leave that up to you. So it can be paper or electronic. It can be auto-generated or it can be handwritten. Um, but it is required uh, for donations of at least $250. And that written acknowledgement must include, first, the basics are the name of the charity, the date of the contribution, and the amount of contribution. But in addition to that, uh, the amount of cash, if it's non-cash, it's a description of the non-cash property contributed. And note that I just say description. It's not a dollar amount. It's not up to the charity to provide uh, value to the donor. That's the donor's responsibility. A statement relating to uh, that whether any goods or services were provided in exchange for the donation, commonly referred to as quid pro quo. You'll see this most often in the case of a, a gala or other fundraising event. Um, and then likewise, if such um, quid pro quo exchange did occur, a description and good faith estimate 
of the value of the goods or services provided. Note also that value is the important word here. It's not the cost to your organization, but it's fair market value. So if you are putting on a gala and you're charging $150 per ticket um, and the, the food and drinks are being donated by a caterer, so the cost to your organization is zero, but the fair market value of the food and drinks provided to the attendee is $60. The $60 needs to be disclosed on the, the ticket um, or solicitation for the event. For donations less than $250, um, including non-cash, uh, it's up to the donor to maintain a written record, which can be a bank record, such as a canceled check, or it can be a written communication from the charity. So that written communication is mandated in gifts of over $250, but as I mentioned, a good relationship practice is to provide it even if it's less than $250 if you have the resources to do so. Um, I also wanted to note uh, back when we were talking about what the written acknowledgement must include um, and a description that last bullet point of good faith estimate of the value. There is an interesting um, description that should be included in the case of church or other uh, faith organizations. Um, the statement should be supplied that says, goods or services, if any, consisted entirely of intangible religious benefits. Um, that was proven in a couple of court cases, so we just want to make sure that uh, that's clear to you. All right. Um, providing the right IRS documentation um, outside of your written acknowledgement letters, of course, there's additional steps that need to take place. Um, in the case of cash, um, very straightforward, written acknowledgement over $250 non-cash written acknowledgement of over $250, including the description of the property on the written acknowledgement. Um, and then uh, for kind of the easy non-cash, which is what our example covered, was your publicly traded security, so easy to value. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Form 8283 and Form 8282 for those types of gifts so I don't want to get um, anybody confused since I'm jumping into the hard-to-value stuff right away. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> um, but for some of these hard-to-value or kind of unusual gifts, um, there are additional limitations and disclosures. So use motor vehicles um, and boats and airplanes if you are provided a gift of these types of items. Um, there's a Form 1098C, uh, should be filed with the IRS, the copy B of that 1098C may serve as written acknowledgement if furnished within 30 days after date of sale. So keep that in mind, especially in your development departments, too, as a good donor um, relationship item, uh, that copy B may, may serve as written acknowledgement, although you'll likely want to provide one in addition to that. Um, Form 8282, um, We'll, we'll get into a little bit more, but Form 8283, it gets kind of confusing. Form 8283 is the one that substantiates the donation on the individual's tax return. And then Form 8282 is what's supplied um, if that property is sold within three years of the donation date. Um, so the 8282 is still required even though a 1098C is, is filed. Very confusing, but uh, let us know if you have any questions on that. For gifts of certain interests in buildings located in registered historic districts, um, there's a limited deduction allowed only if certain criteria are met. So be careful about accepting gifts um, of this type of property. A qualified appraisal is required. Photos um, are also needing to be included in that. Um, Form 8283 is required if over the $5,000. Um, and in, in this particular case, a voucher payment um, 
filed with Form 8283-V for voucher. Um, it's a $500 payment. It's required if a donor is taking a deduction of greater than $10,000. And then if that property is sold within three years of receipt by your organization, then the 8282 is required as well. Taxidermy property. This is, you know, sometimes, especially in higher ed, you get uh, some interesting gifts of art. Um, so should you come across taxidermy property um, and you get questions from the donor, this particular um, property is limited on the donor's tax return to a deduction of basis or fair market value, whichever is less. There are some specific rules about uh, what the basis is or the cost um, to the donor was. Um, that Form 8283 is required if it's uh, over $5,000, and then if it's sold within three years, then the 8282 is also required. A little bit more standard is the clothing and household items. Uh, must be in good used condition or better for a deduction typically, although if uh, donating something that's not in good condition, an appraisal is required. So your donor can take a deduction for that um, as long as that appraisal is attached. Um, these types of items do not include food, paintings, jewelry, or other collections. Um, and the fair market value is the valuation used. Again, when you're providing documentation to them via written acknowledgement, you're not providing a value. But should they ask, there's a, a couple of IRS pubs uh, that help document, uh, walk through the deduction, and show how to, if an appraisal is required or if you can use certain other um, assessments. In this case, a, a thrift shop, shop value would be an appropriate determination of fair market value. Other types of gifts that the IRS specifically addresses and has um, specific documentation rules for are qualified and tangible property. <clears throat> so if somebody's donating you royalty or copyright, um, property subject to debt, which is probably something that will happen more often than not, um, especially in the case of real estate donations. Um, partial interests are generally not allowed. Um, so somebody can't gift you half of the hospital. Um, what they can, can likely do is put the hospital in a partnership and then gift you an interest in the partnership, that kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's ways to move around this, but for the most part, partial interests are not allowed. Um, and then just a reminder, since we just covered some weird um, gifts that you won't see all the time or very often or maybe ever, uh, just these might be items that you specifically call out in your gift acceptance policy that um, you know we're not interested in uh, buildings located in registered historic districts or taxidermy property or debt financed real estate. Um, if, in addition to that, if you do are, or are approached um, by a donor with a non-standard gift and you don't know how to handle it, there are resources out there that can help facilitate the gift itself. The community foundation in your neighborhood is going to be a great resource for that. And different organizations like the National Christian Foundation is one that facilitates a lot of non-standard gifts and have a process pretty well ironed out. Okay. And here's where we're going to identify that 8283 in a little bit more detail. Form 8283 is uh, a form filed by the donor to substantiate their gift. There's two sections, section A and section B of this form if you haven't seen it before. Section A is completed for property less than $5,000 and publicly traded securities. It requests information like name and address of the donee, so your organization in this case, a description of the property, the date of the contribution to your organization, the date that the donor acquired the property, and an estimate's okay. <clears throat> How it was acquired, 
by the donor? Was it purchased? Was it a gift? Was it passed down through inheritance, perhaps an exchange, um, a 1031 exchange or like kind of exchange? What the donor's cost basis? Um, and, and this should be left blank if it's held for longer than 12 months, so it's long-term property, or it's publicly traded securities should also include fair market value and what method was used to determine the fair market value. So again, that is the section for property less than $5,000 and publicly traded securities. This is um, <clears throat> a pretty standard form filed with an individual's tax return um, who gives uh, a lot of charitable contributions. Um, but likely your organization won't see Section A completed. Section B is really the one that applies to you most often. Section B is completed for property greater, valued greater than $5,000. The information needed in, in this section um, is similar to the, the information I just described for Section A, but in addition to that, there is a declaration and signature of an appraiser um, your acknowledgement, so the acknowledgement of the organization receiving the donation, the date the property is received by your organization, <clears throat> affirmation to complete the form 8282 if sold within three years of receipt, whether you intend to use the property for an unrelated use or if it's mission oriented, <clears throat> and then a signature, um, and that is um, more collaborative in nature between the, the nonprofit, um, the donor, and then an appraiser. Um, so that 8283 is filed with the IRS and a copy is provided to the, uh, to the charitable organization receiving the gift. Um, and so let's say that uh, your organization receives um, a house valued at $225,000. I did receive a, a qualified appraisal, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you don't intend to use it within your mission, you intend to liquidate. <clears throat> so that 8283 is filed with a donor's tax return, a copy of it is provided to you, and then upon liquidation of that property, if within three years of receiving it, Form 8282 is then filed to the IRS. That form needs to be filed within 125 days. Um, and this form is actually um, supposed to help the IRS match the value of the item with the valuation at the date of contribution. Form 8282 does not apply to uh, non-cash contributions that had Section A completed, so less than $500 or publicly traded securities or if the items were consumed by your nonprofit. So if you're a, a food bank um, and you receive um, a, a large donation of uh, canned goods um, and you use that in your mission um, and it's consumed by the organization, then Form 8282 is not required. All right. One more polling question. When was your written gift acceptance policy last reviewed? Within the last one to two years? Within the last three to five years? You're not sure, you don't have a policy, or you don't work for a nonprofit. Don't forget to hit submit. I'll give you about 20 seconds. All right, um, this is great news. Your gift acceptance policies m mainly have, um, except for those organizations that don't know, have been reviewed within the last one to two years. So that's great news. Um, for those of you that don't know, it might be worth a refresher just to see um, if you need any updating based off of this conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to April to wrap us up. Okay, thanks, Angie. 
So what are some of the questions that the organization should be considering when either drafting or revisiting your gift acceptance policies? So the first question that you should start out with is whether your organization is willing to is, is either willing to or is still willing to accept gifts that are non-cash or non-marketable securities. Do you are you willing to accept a used vehicle or real estate or non-liquid securities um, or intellectual property? Um, if the answer to that question is no, that's okay. You just need to document that and move forward. Um, for those of you who are in private foundations or supporting organizations that have an annual distribution requirement, um, the possibility of holding an illiquid asset in your portfolio is also something that you need to consider when dis deciding what assets you're willing to accept. The next question um, you need to answer after you've decided what kind of gifts you're willing to accept um, is what kind of review needs to occur before your organization will accept an individual gift? Um, who will pay the expenses incurred during that review process? Who will pay for the consultation with the attorney, with the accountant, um, regarding any special issues relating to that gift under review? Um, if there's real property, there needs to be a title search. Um, if it's one of those, you know, if it's tax germy property, um, what additional disclosures do we need to um, do as an organization in order to comply with all of those IRS regulations? So who's going to pay, with, pay for those additional expenses incurred for the gifts that we're accepting? Okay. After you've chosen what gifts to accept, you do you have the procedures in place to make sure that the IRS forms that Angie was mentioning are completed relating to the donations? Um, if the contribution is valued at more than $5,000, the organization um, may need to sign a section of Form 8283, um, Part B, for the donor to attach to their his or her tax return. So does your organization have the ability to track – oops, sorry – I apologize. Um, should you be sending that signed document with your acknowledgement letter? Um, are you as an organization going to wait for the donor to contact the organization for that signature? What's that policy going to be? Um, and then the second thing is, does the organization have a procedure in place to track donated property so that if you do sell it within that three-year period, you will know to file the 8282 um, with, within the 120 days um, of selling that property. Do you have a list somewhere that you keep track of your donated assets that you may liquidate within the next three-year period? Um, so that's another question to keep in mind. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back to Angie to wrap us up. Thanks, April. So just a brief overview of, of what was covered today. Um, we do suggest your organization have a written gift acceptance policy. Um, some conversations have taken place regarding what should go in a gift acceptance policy, and that's entirely up to your organization. It can be a policy that just covers non-standard gift acceptance. So it doesn't cover um, acknowledgments, it doesn't cover um, IRS procedure, it doesn't cover internal procedures, really just what happens if somebody approaches us to give something other than cash and publicly traded securities. Or your written policy does cover all those other things and it's more of a procedural-based policy. Um, or you can have a, a policy that's high level and then have a guideline for internal based off of that policy. It's up to your organization. These are just suggestions and best practices that we've seen in different ways of doing things. Um, no matter which way you decide to go, the policy should be reviewed periodically. Um, periodically is, is, again, not defined by anybody but your organization. So does that mean um, every other year? Does that mean every three to four years? 
depends probably on how many non-cash gifts you're receiving and how often you rely on that policy, how often your development um, team is turning over, um, your board is turning over, that kind of thing to be considered. And then update it periodically too. If you find yourself receiving gifts that you've never received before or starting to get a high number of inquiries about non-standard gifts, perhaps it's a time to update your policy to include an additional language to clarify what's, what you're willing to accept or what you're not willing to accept um, based off of what your constituents are telling you and your donors are telling you. All right, and so we do have some q and I'm going to let Emily kick it off and deliver those to us. All right, thanks Angie. It looks like our first question is, I'm confused by the stock gift example. We would record the gift at $9,000, $90 times 100 shares based on the value of the stock on the date we received. If they're looking for okay. some clarification. So that is a very good point. Um, each organization does things a little bit differently. So for example, for your organization, you would have recorded it at the $90 per share when it was received into your account. In the example that I had, they received it, they recorded it at the amount of cash they received, which was the $95. Uh, so it, it mainly has to do with how the organization's policies are set up. I think you, I believe the person um, that asked the question was from a higher ed um, institution. Um, and so there are some industry-specific uh, revenue recognition um, things to consider. But the other, the alternative side is you have a pledge for $10,000. The other question that comes up is, well, what do I do with the difference between the pledge and the amount that I actually receive, whether that's the $90 that $90 per share that of when it landed in my bank my investment account or the $95 a share of cash I received when I sold the property. And that's the other question that you need to consider within your organization is do we do I write off that difference, which would normally be what I would expect, that's a pledge loss for most organizations, or is that something that the organization expects to um, have the donor contribute additional funds to pay up their entire pledge amount. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what about planned giving? CRUTs, CGAs, et cetera, should those be in a separate policy? I'll take a stab at that. Um, Emily, thanks for asking. Um, so in this case, the question is asking um, about charitable remainder trusts and charitable gift annuities, and how should those be addressed in your gift acceptance policy, or should they be a separate plan giving policy? And again, that's up to your organization. We've seen it done uh, both ways. Um, but ultimately, uh, charitable remainder trusts and charitable gift annuities are uh, uh, vehicles for giving donations, and they can house. Um, cash, they can be funded, but likely not. Um, they can be funded by uh, highly appreciated uh, publicly traded securities. Um, they can also be funded by non-standard gifts. So I've seen charitable remainder trusts with um, land and property, including a coffee shop um, in it. Uh, so, so since charitable remainder trusts, charitable gift annuities, and the like all encompass um, a, a means of giving, and can be non-standard, the policies, if not included with each other, um, should parlay well together. So if, if you decide that you would like to have two separate policies on those items, um, there will be some overlap, like a Venn diagram. Um, or you can include uh, addressing the, the nuances of charitable remainder trust, charitable gift annuities, and similar other vehicles within your non-standard um, or gift acceptance policy in general. Um, I, w I personally like having an in one policy, but that's a personal um, information instead of uh, IRS or best practice. Um, so thanks again for asking that question. 
Great, thank you. Uh, another question came in, how do we explain to our donors that we will not accept the asset that they want to give us? Okay, I think I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, so as we've mentioned, uh, Angie and I have mentioned, um, the reason that we have these gift acceptance policies is because the, the charitable organization is in the business of providing a charitable service, not necessarily in the business of holding and maintaining a piece of real estate or curating art collections or um, or um, selling reselling vehicles that are donated to the organization. So um, I would say that uh, the conversation needs doesn't have to come from someone in the the accounting department. It might need to come from the board or the executive director, but that conversation needs to be had with the donor that giving or donating an asset to the charity that's outside of their charitable use um, causes some distraction and can pull attention away from providing that charitable um, service to the or to the community by having to handle these assets that are outside the normal um, operating procedures of the charity. Thank you, April. And it looks like we have a couple more. What if we expressly prohibit a gift in our policy but find a situation that is mutually beneficial? Are we then prohibited from accepting the gift? What a good question. So uh, that's a that's a frustrating thing about having too many policies in place and having your hands tied um, by a particular policy. When we were discussing who should um, be involved in the acceptance of a non-standard gift, whether that be a committee or the full board, what levels the board should be involved in terms of uh, if it should be a monetary uh, level or threshold or if it should be a type of gift. Um, I think that particular exception that's being asked about should be or could be addressed within the policy to say at any point we, um, we the organization, uh, have the right to provide additional exceptions not otherwise um, expressly addressed within this policy. Um, and that way it can go to the board for the board to review cost-benefit analysis and provide final confirmation or uh, denial of that particular gift. Thanks for asking. Thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Has the IRS focused attention on this area recently? Boy, have they. So uh, starting, uh, I want to say some of the case law, uh, it goes back to um, 2005, 2006, um, just from memory. And the IRS has actually denied deductions on the individual side for uh, non-cash and cash contributions for various reasons. Some of these um, include not having proper substantiation on the individual side, so either didn't have the appropriate gift acknowledgement letter, it wasn't contemporaneous, so uh, it wasn't timely provided, um, so by the due date of the tax return um, is when those gift acknowledgement letters need to be provided. Um, and and then in addition to that, there has been cases where uh, the dollar amount has been adjusted because either there was no appraisal, um, the appraisal was done by perhaps a conflicted party, uh, <clears throat> or the IRS just didn't agree with the appraisal in general. Um, and so, so this is not a, a area to be taken lightly. Um, while it does not necessarily directly impact your organization, uh, it really does impact relations with donors um, and the public relations side of things. So I encourage you um, to take a, a, a review of your gift acceptance policy and make sure that you have the proper procedures in place to um, provide the written acknowledgement, make sure it has the proper wording in it, uh, make sure you're not assigning value 
for non-cash donations, but just providing a description of those donations. Um, sending those contemporaneously, so no later than April 15th of the, the prior period. Um, so gifts for 2016, um, if you're doing an annual statement, that annual statement should be provided no later than April 15th um, of 2017. And, uh, and then taking a look at uh, what happens for non-standard or at, at the very least non-cash gifts. Um, are your donors filing 8283s? And if so, with a gift over $5,000, receive a copy, maintain for your files, and if you sell it, file form 8282. And if you receive any of those other non-standards like um, uh, automobiles, boats, airplanes, make sure to file Form 1098C, and anything else, um, I encourage you to reach out to your tax advisor just to make sure that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's on your end to make sure that your donor can take that donation on their 1040. Great, thank you, Angie. Uh, looks like that is all we have time for for questions today. Um, if you still have questions, feel free to reach out to April or Angie, um, and I'll also be leaving the console open if you would like to submit a question to the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be happy to follow up with you after the webcast. Uh, thank you again, Angie and April, for a great presentation today. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group, and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet in order to receive credit. And you can download this from the slide deck and handouts icon at the bottom of your screen. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE icon at the bottom of your screen. I'll keep the webcast on console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.